Hello, everyone. My name is Antoine Lee. I am a 2020 Burning Man Honorarium recipient and artist and architect for the Solar Shrine Project. During Burn Week, we are pleased to bring to you virtual DJ sets, artist performances, yoga sessions, and conversations with grassroots activists, among other events. It is my pleasure to bring to you today a virtual conversation on Afrofuturism, Ancient Egypt and Nubia's influence on contemporary art with Dr. Vanessa Davies and artist Michael and Anthony Brown. So, um, hello guys, how are you all doing? Well, how are you? Good, good, I'm so happy to like uh, have you um, to be a part of this conversation. I have a conversation with you. Um, so I wanna give, uh, I'm gonna give a, a little bit of uh, a uh, brief background um, of each of these uh, wonderful people. Uh, Dr. Vanessa Davies is an Egyptologist who is currently writing a book centered on scholars of African descent. She received her PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations from the University of Chicago. The book brings to light previously unknown conversations that took place in the early 20th century between white Egyptologists in the United States and Europe and scholars of African descent in the US. Her early work focuses on the interplay of ancient Egyptian art and text. She is the author of the book, Peace in Ancient Egypt, 2018, um, and the co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of Egyptian Epigraphy and Paleography, 2020. Michael Anthony Brown is a contemporary painter, sculptor, and filmmaker. He currently lives in Washington, DC. He attended Howard University for his graduate studies. Michael's work has been exhibited in major museums and galleries around the world. He has also been featured in national magazines and has made television appearances. Recently, in 2017, he had a one-man show at the Venezuelan Embassy in Washington, D.C., and in 2018, he had a solo spectrum exhibition at Art Basel in Miami, Florida. In his spare time, Michael studies the subject of history and volunteers in his community. So guys, it is like, once again, a pleasure to have you all here. Um, so I want to, um, um, we want to take a few minutes to just basically, you, you know, you all to give um, you know, discuss your background. Uh, Vanessa, let's start with you. Sure. Um, so, yeah, so I'm an Egyptologist and I came to the study of ancient Egypt through the study of um, the, the modern cultures of that region. So I, when I went to college, I studied Arabic for many years um, and I did a semester abroad in Cairo I um, did my archaeological training in Jordan in the summers, and when uh, the, those seasons were, were over, I would go to Egypt and travel around and spend more time in Egypt living in that culture and learning about the sites there. And at some point, it occurred to me that I should really um, move my focus of study backwards in time rather than focusing on the modern culture of that region i should i should really look at at the ancient cultures in ancient egypt specifically and so i i went to graduate school for egyptology and while i was in graduate school i worked as an epigrapher in a temple in luxor and so that meant that i spent every day right sort of up at the temple wall studying the carved art and the text that was with the art um, and the paint that was put on top of all of that carving. Um, so I spent a lot of time up close and personal with uh, that material and that uh, really in, informed my own research um, because I work on the interplay of, of art and text and especially on the walls of temples and tombs. And uh, yeah, so when I, when I was teaching as a graduate student and, and then after graduate school as a professor, I, I really cared a lot about making this material relevant to students um, because most of the students who took my classes weren't 
planning on becoming Egyptologists. You know, they just kind of thought Egypt was cool or, you know, maybe they're just getting rid of a course requirement, whatever. Um, and, and I really wanted this material to not just be about a culture that is thousands of, year old, thousands of years old. I wanted it um, to really resonate with them. And I wanted them to see how um, this art still, still has meaning for communities today. Um, and that's why your project, Antoine, is so exciting to me because you're drawing on, on a lot of the, the imagery, the architecture, and, and making it resonate in, in the lives of people in our contemporary world. Awesome, awesome. That's amazing. That's amazing. University of Chicago, shout out, shout out to Chicago. <laughs> and uh, uh, Mr. Brown, could you tell us more about yourself? Okay, well, I'm a visual artist, um, primarily. I've actually, that's all I've ever done up until recently. Um, a recent hire, I'm a professor at Howard University. Uh, prior to that, and even during this time, all I've ever done is artwork. I've done um, multiple mediums. I started very young, training it, as it were. At 13 years of age, I was accepted into a program that I was too young to be accepted in, but they did it because I was there when I was 12. Um, and they let me come in when I was 13. That said, I, um, I've done a, a, a lot of work all around um, in every area of art. In multiple cities, I've um, in 1979, I went to Egypt with Dr. Ben Yosef Ben Jokanan to, and that was my introduction into um, the physical aspects of Egypt uh, or Kemet and um, the culture and history. I uh, from there did have done quite a bit of work. And fairly recently, I've worked on a dig with uh, the Asa Restoration Project um, in South Asafi there um, in Egypt. And so that's been very enlightening in a number of ways, especially as an artist, basically helping to restore um, what is basically works of art. We know temples are structures, the physical structures, but basically, these structures are more than physical dwellings. They're, um, they're power, empowerment places. They are often aligned to the north-south axis and aligned to certain stars and various other things like that. So what happens is most traditional structures of spiritual nature um, are aligned in those ways, whether we know it or not. We just say, hey, oh, it's just on this street or that street. But no, these structures have historically been aligned for specific purposes to focus and crystallize energy in certain spots and in certain ways and to be able to disseminate that energy throughout the space. So when we talk about sacred space, it's not just the, the space, it's all, everything involved, the ge geographical location of it, um, how it's aligned, where its walls are, are it, it, the height, the ceiling, the thicknesses. Then you get to the artistic aspect where they infuse it with um, artwork, all types, sculptures, um, writings, um, and various other objects of that nature. So that's how we kind of came together. That's amazing, man. That's amazing. I've never been to Egypt. I've always wanted to go to Egypt since I was a kid. I remember like when I was like nine years old, I think they, in the 1989, it was like 1984, 85 or whenever that was, but they had the King Tut exhibit was, it was traveling the world and it came to the field museum. So I'm, I must have, I was in third grade, so it must have been, I must have been like eight or nine or something like that. So I remember that. I always had a fascinating with Egypt, as you know, um, the Soul Shrine Project. But uh, yeah, that, that's absolutely amazing, man. That's absolutely amazing. So Vanessa, I want, uh, could you please tell us uh, about your book, um, with, uh, which researches the relationship between sociologist and historian uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, the archeologist, Flinders Petrie. Sure. Um, 
So I'm, I've been very interested in bringing into the, the academic history of Egyptology the voices of scholars of African descent because they are currently not a part of that history and they should be. Um, and so my point of entry to this project was um, some writings I found of Marcus Garvey's from 1923. He was writing an editorial in his newspaper and he was criticizing the professor of Egyptology at Harvard at that time. And um, the work that he was doing was later carried on by his wife, Amy Jacques Garvey, also in the newspaper. And so this was fascinating to me because I didn't know anything about this. Egyptologists don't know anything about this. Um, and, but that conversation led me to the next one, which is the one you mentioned, which is um, a set of letters that were exchanged between W.E.B. Du Bois and a British archaeologist named Flinders Petrie. And again, this is a relationship that no one in Egyptology really knows about. A, a few people in the UK do, but besides them, that's it. Um, and so the, these letters were exchanged between the two of them in 1912. And, and again, it's fascinating. They're having a disagreement on, on um, an issue that relates both to ancient history and to contemporary Egypt and contemporary America. And so I, I sort of started tracking their relationship and I found that they had met in person a year prior. And, and I think that they actually first made contact in 1909 when Du Bois invited Flinders Petrie to be on his advisory board for the Encyclopedia Africana that he was putting together. So this is just huge. I, I had found these two amazing sets of um, academic disagreements that are really important to the history of Egyptology because in the early 20th century, that's when Egyptology is first being established in the United States as part of the university curriculum. So this is a really critical moment for Egyptology in the US. Um, and I thought, you know, that maybe there are some other conversations happening in that era in the early 20th century. And sure enough, I found others. Um, one of my favorites involves um, an African-American woman named Pauline Hopkins, who wrote what is essentially an Afrofuturist novel. And in that novel, she pulls in all sorts of different historical sources to make an academic argument through the mouths of the characters in her novel. So that, I'm, she's one of my favorites, but there are others. I mean, you mentioned University of Chicago. The first Egyptologist there was James Henry Breasted, and he was corresponding with Booker T. Washington. So, so my book is really to bring to lay all of these conversations and to make them a part of the disciplinary history of Egyptology. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's awesome. Um, yeah, could you, could you, could you, I want to add just as an aside, could you talk about your now, um, now uh, River Valley Project a little bit? Oh, the, the Nile Valley Collective? Yes, Nile Valley Collective, just briefly. Yes, so you can find us online at nilevalleycollective.org. Um, I, I got together with a group of colleagues, scholars from around the world who um, are Egyptologists who, and who approach Egyptology from different sub-disciplines. So we have um, some physical anthropologists, some linguists, um, we have museum curators, we have um, cultural historians, uh, and we're all people who are interested in situating the ancient cultures of the Nile River Valley in their African context. So we've sort of banded together and, and decided to offer ourselves as a resource to scholars, to institutions, to students, anyone who, who wants to understand these ancient cultures better from an African perspective, we are making ourselves available to talk with them. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's really good. That's good. That's, That's great really stuff. Wonderful. That's amazing. Um, so, Michael, you briefly touched on, you know, when you were talking about, you know, your background, you know, some of the your experiences with archaeological digs. I want to know if you could elaborate a little bit more about that. It's fascinating stuff. Well, I will. I was. Um, 
lucky enough to be asked by Anthony Browder, who is basically um, running the ASA Restoration Project in South Asafi in Egypt now. Um, he took over um, to assist from Elena Prochovic um, and um, has been generating money, which is a key aspect for DIG and very challenging, um, as well as organizing uh, the DIG, the workers, the salaries, the equipment, the site, the management, and all of that. Now, obviously, anything that's done in Egypt, the Egyptian government basically is in control of, they own, and all of that. So basically, this has been, at least for the past <laughs> 10 years or so, uh, funded by um, primarily African Americans um, who are supporting uh, Tony Browder or Anthony Browder and his projects. Uh, and if you're unfamiliar, he's a lecturer, um, historian, uh, author, um, and the head of a dig, which, you know, uh, th so that's amazing to me, um, multifaceted. I think that um, my work there was, uh, I was asked to come there because I'm an artist. I carved stone, um, and there's plenty of stone there that needed work. Now, with respect to restoring a temple or a tomb, there's certain things that you are allowed to do and certain things you're not allowed to do. So anything that might be interpretation is not allowed. But with respect to the physical structure and repairing and showing up and um, rebuilding pillars and the like, that is allowed. Um, we wouldn't be allowed to recarve hieroglyph from Meta Netra to the temple walls but we would be allowed to rebuild those temple walls. And it, it, if you get to that dig, you'll see what literally a jigsaw puzzle of tens of thousands of pieces have been systematically put back together, which is a phenomenal task for all of those volunteers and, and people who work there. It's absolutely incredible. And when we speak of ancient texts and infusement and things of that nature, you have um, aspects, a complete aspect of the coming forth by day and by night, which some people know aspects of it. They called it, Wallace Bulge titled it initially the Book of the Dead. Uh, later uh, interpretations have changed the title to the Book of the Coming Forth and by Day and by Night, which seems to be a little more in tune with that um, I guess if you would, a traditional uh, African concept of give and flow, ebb and take, as opposed to something being dead or finite. It's a cyclical thing. So um, that aspect was phenomenal. And being able to get up close to Egyptian walls and touch them, for me, was phenomenal because I've been to a lot of temples, a lot of all over Egypt, but you're not allowed to get close. You get close, they're like, you know, some guys there's like, no, 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 you gotta back up for this and the other. Well, for me, I read brush strokes, I read carving strokes and all of that. I can tell you how fast someone moved, um, how slow, how deliberate, um, and energy and various other things like that. So what happens is, being able to work up close on the dig, I realized it wasn't one person that did these carvings. There were several people that did it. One person came by and initially roughed it in. Somebody else came by after them and cleaned that up a little bit. And that third guy that came by or person was very quick because I could see his tool marks or the tool marks left in stone. So that told me how fast they were moving and various other things like that. So all of that's just a phenomenal process and really an honor to, to be allowed, let alone asked to, um, to participate and support uh, that effort, so. That's amazing, man, that's, that's really amazing. That's awesome, that's awesome. Um, you know, yeah, I, uh, I know at the University of Chicago, the Chicago House, they have like the epigraphy project and they, that's one of the, they were one of the first institutions to do that, where they go and they just document 
is at Ramses the Third's temple, uh, Madinet Habu, I think it is. Correct me if that, I'm correct about that, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so that's the Chicago house. They, you know, they they just specialize in epigraphy, exactly what you're doing, and you know, following it. And as technology has advanced, now it's no more just using paper and stenciling over things. It's actually using cameras and creating 3D models and things like that. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. It is. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Vanessa, can you discuss how the deity Ra in ancient Egyptian and Nubian cosmology is applied um, in art today? Yeah, sure. Um, so Ra is, is the sun god, as most people may know. Um, the word Ra actually means sun. Um, and so the, the sun rising in the morning is, is the birth of Ray, and Ray travels through the sky during the day in a, in a solar bark, a boat that goes through the sky. And then um, when, when the sun sets, that is Ray going into the underworld to then right, be birthed again the next day. So the, the, in ancient Egypt, there was a, a lot of imagery associated with Ray. Um, I mean, at its most basic level, Ray might be depicted at, as, a, as a circle, Ray on a, on a wall, for instance, like the sun disk. Um, when Ray was the rising sun, Ray would be called uh, Kepri and would be depicted as a, a beetle. Um, and, and Ray might also be depicted as a ram or a ram-headed man. Um, the sun god might be combined with other deities. So like the deity Amun might be combined with Ray to be Amun Ray. Um, and there, there are all sorts of combinations that happen. And so I can show you a few, um, a few images of the sun god in some contemporary art. So when I was living in the Bay Area, um, I was taking pictures. There was a tremendous amount of mural art in the Bay Area that used Egyptianizing themes in it, and I was taking pictures of it. So that's what I'm going to show you today. Um, this particular piece of mural art is at Skyline High School in Oakland, California. And so you can see um, a, a clearly a man of, of African descent wearing the royal headdress and if you can see he's got a tattoo on his chest that looks like a head of Nefertiti which I really love um, and next to him is an enormous scarab beetle enormous Kepri beetle um, representing the rising sun and you can kind of see in in the uh, in, in the two front feet of the beetle um, a circle right and that would be the sun disk um, so, so we have Ray represented here uh, at Skyline High School. Um, this mural, this is two shots of the same mural, is incredibly long. The building that it was on is actually demolished now, so you can't see this anymore. But on the left side, you have a, a falcon-headed man with a sun disk on his head, and that is... Um, the deity Ray Harakti. So that is Ray, the sun god, combined with um, Horus of the horizon. And then at the other end, at the, at the right end of the mural, you have a, a woman, clearly ancient Egyptianizing figure here, um, with cow horns on her head and the sun disk between it. So again, all this solar imagery. Um, and finally, this one is uh, from another high school, this is from Met West High School, I think, in Oakland also. And this was in progress when I took it, which is why it doesn't, it's not fully painted. But this mural was combining um, motifs from a variety of different cultures. But you can see there's clearly um, a pyramid, an Egyptian looking pyramid, as well as a, a New World pyramid. Um, and a figure that looks an awful lot like, um, a head of a statue from the old kingdom right next to that pyramid with the falcon god behind the king's head. So those are just um, a few examples. Of That's amazing. Thing. That's amazing. Mural art is like amazing. I love mural art. Yeah, I do too. I do too. And it, I mean, 
Antoine, your project, I think, is so great because you've pulled a lot of this imagery and the, and the architectural elements that go along with it into your solar shrine. So, like, so for instance, I pulled these images from your website. I mean, in, you, you have the solar bark, first of all, down in the lower left corner with the sun disk. Your, your front feature where the, where the blasters are, are those blasters? The they, call them, they call them poofers. Poofers, okay. Poofers, yeah. Where the poofers are, I mean, that looks like the, the front gate of an Egyptian temple, and you've got the sun disk in there. And it, I mean, that we think that the, the imagery of the front gate of an Egyptian temple is supposed to represent the horizon. And you've got the sun disk in the horizon, which is, which is amazing ancient Egyptian um, imagery you've got there. So I wanted to ask you, while we've got this up on the screen, I mean, you could have done anything for Burning Man. What made you choose um, the deity Ray and the solar bark and this amazing installation. What made you do this for Burning Man? Well, as you know, I, I have a love of Egypt. You know, I've been studying Egypt since I was a kid. And, um, you know, I've been really into archaeology um, and, and art. Um, but like the whole inspiration behind so the project is uh, is really a lot about the boat and it's, it's tied to the boat and it's tied to the, the solar cosmology so a lot of people don't know that like the the boat that that boat is like you know pre-dynastic or way back before Egypt became like uh, a kingdom and you can find it um, boats and a lot of rock art in the eastern and western deserts of Egypt and and uh, and the lower Nubia so I was just really like drawn to like this, you know, the, the boat and then the solar disc as the center of this project because it is. It's not just it's, it's, it's not just about you know the tall thirty foot thirty foot high you know tower a gateway or the shrine itself. It's to house the, the physical manifestation of Ra. And so in 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 ancient times in pre dynastic times in rock art or petroglyphs they would draw these boats. And to the ancient Egyptians and Nubians, you know, we know what we conceive and to believe is that, you know, boats had paranormal qualities. They were a form of technology to hunt down animals in the Nile Valley and take prisoners and things like that. And over time, they combined it to be connected to their solar cosmology. So they began to ritualize boats of parts. And so it's just really fascinating. So that was like the centerpiece. And then I use other examples, other pieces of architecture, like the gateway. As you know, they have like the most Egyptian temples have the gateways that you enter. You enter in like a portal, a place, you know, you're crossing that threshold from this world to the next world. And then you have the actual physical structure that houses the bark, um, which is like the shrine itself. And so the shrine, in my eyes, is like, you know, a... Um, like a resurrection machine. Not only is it for the sun, but it's also to resurrect, you know, connect to the ancestral spirits. And um, so some of those, like the, the shapes of it, the, the shrine itself is like a mastaba. The mastaba was, a mastaba was like a predecessor to the pyramids. If you look at the step pyramids um, developed by Hotep, it was um, a series of mastabas stacked on top of each, of, the, of each other and was thought to be like, you know, like the predecessor of the actual pyramids that we know at the Great Pyramid of, 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 of Giza. So, you know, a lot of like shapes like that. So, you know, trying to use art forms from the past, but have them um, with, you know, look more modern. It, it looks like, you know, I'm in Egypt, but it looks like I'm also, I could put this in like Singapore somewhere else. It could be like a, a contemporary art installation. So I was just trying to play off with some of that stuff. You know, I think it's. Awesome. I love it. Thank you, thank you. Um, Definitely. Yeah. So. So, um, Michael, um, some of your art uses ancient Egyptian and Nubian foundations as a basis. Um, can you please discuss more about this? Okay. Well. I was going to start with the art, but since we started with this, this book popped up, uh, I'll start with the book. Um, this was a, 
this was done who maybe 25 years ago maybe maybe earlier maybe 30 um a book by anthony browder um speaking to the now valley's uh, contributions to civilizations so this one is pretty straightforward you have um a sphinx with pyramids in the background and an obelisk uh, in, in between his paws. Um, I took some liberties there. There's an ankh on his chest and um, the sphinx that we're aware of, well, see, does not have his beard intact. There's theories about what happened to the beard, but uh, the beard is not intact. We have a uh, falcon, you know, flying down through, but creating a, um, a transition from the past to the present because there are a lot of structures that are built today that are reminiscent or paired um, or imitating structures of, uh, of ancient Egypt. Uh, specifically with me living in DC, I can't help but think of the Washington Monument. It's a very huge obelisk or Tekken or techie new, um, uh, as well as some of these other structures that, that, that were put there. And then when you think about, uh, if, we've, if you've been to Las Vegas and seen the pyramids and some of the other things that they have there on the strip, it's absolutely amazing. But it's, it's just interesting to me how a foundation can be laid thousands of years ago and it echoes through time. So I think that these structures of antiquity will continue to be um, repeated in architectural form um, for many of the various reasons why they were initially done, but with modern aspects of it as well. And I, I think that's just how life works. We, we build off of um, the past. And as such, um, it was a continuing, continuing thing. This, um, this is an earlier piece called um, Family Tree of Life. Um, and it's actually based on um, various points of uh, energy in the body. Um, and uh, and, and we, know, we know those points as Tree of Life. Um, so the, the various uh, planets or stars or moons um, and you can see pyramids in the background with uh, an adinkra symbol out of West Africa um, over top of them to the bottom left. Uh, is, so you have the mother, the father, and the child there. Um, and so it's just playing with you know the four elements in the four corners of earth, air, fire, and water and um, the planets and flowers and the like. So that, you know, that's that one. This one uh, is self, I mean, if you read it, it says a first lesson. But what happens is on the right, the left, you can see the, the image of the painting, but I included this drawing on the right to show you how, if you would, the information was uh, from Egypt or at ancient Africa, was basically the superstructure on which this painting was built. So you have um, you have the Sphinx in there. It's actually behind the waterfall with the step pyramid in front of it. Um, you have um, rocks form forming uh, uh, everything. Uh, we have uh, we have. One of my favorite things in there, and it's, it's the bird of Saqqara. It was found in a, a tomb in Saqqara by um, the Step Pyramid. And um, it was discovered in the 1950s. Uh, it was on exhibit in, uh, I believe, the British Museum. And an uh, astrophysicist from the United States, from NASA, was on vacation and saw it. And it was put with all the other birds. but. It noticed, he noticed that the tail on this, this, this bird was straight up where the tails on all of the other birds there were flat. And, and he took some other 
notes and he explained who he was. They allowed him to take measurements. They took that, he took those measurements back to NASA. They built it, put it in a wind tunnel and it flew. It was a glider. It meant that the bottom part of the wing of the bird was straight where the top part of the wing was curved and um, creating more distance. So with thrust, it would create lift because the air um, under the wing would move past faster than the air over the wing. And that's basically the science that we use today for jets and everything else. So, um, so there are a number of things like that. We have Imhotep, um, uh, the, Nep the bus of Nefertiti, Otari, depending on how you pronounce that there. Um, we have uh, uh, other elements, but this is just basically me using a superstructure, like um, if you would, um, an architect would use um, blueprint or uh, uh, build a foundation for the structure to, to paint, in my case, a painting. So that's, that's what this is just called first lesson. This one is called a flower song. It's dealing with similar um, aspects. There, um, there are things hitting inside. The woman is playing uh, a sitar-like instrument, but in her hand, she's holding an ankh. Um, behind her is Heru with the crown of up in Lower Egypt. Above uh, Heru, the flower actually forms uh, what we call the all-seeing eye, which actually is a mathematical um, symbol. It represents infinity as the eye would because each part of it represents from one half to one quarter to one eighth to one sixteenth and one thirty-second, symbolizing um, that this would go on into infinity. So it's actually a symbol of infinity, what we know as the all-seeing eye. The all-seeing eye is directly over Heru or um, uh, Horimachus, the uh, uh, Sphinx, uh, is here. So, and in this, you find Narma minis back in the, um, the rocks. You have um, an Egyptian scribe writing on the back of the leaf in a classical kneeling position. The pond is actually in the shape of the continent of Africa. It's inverted um, because the way we look at Africa is basically is upside downwards. Um, so this is the way it was done. Um, and there's actually uh, the waves in the, um, in the pond from the different countries in Africa. And there's a proverb in the ripples that says only a fool thirsts in the midst of knowledge. So um, this one's called the flower song. Um, so this again is that foundation um, uh, that this painting was built around. Um, and again, I think foundations are important because every one of us lives in a building that before they built the building, they may have drawn the blueprints out, I'm sure, but it's the first thing that they did was build a foundation to support the structure. So it's just still playing with the science of building three-dimensionally in a two-dimensional aspect. So that's just, uh, and it's, it's called a flower song. It's amazing. It's amazing. Awesome. Awesome. That's a lot. That's, a, that's various beautiful stuff, man. Well, thank beautiful you. stuff. Um, so Michael, like one of the things that the Sella Shrine wants to do as a, as a contemporary art installation is engage people on the topic of Afrofuturism and make the connections to history and mythology. Can you like briefly list just for people, um, list some artists of our time who have used Egyptian and Nubian imagery and iconography? Well, yes, I can. When I, think of, when I think of that, first thing that comes to my mind is Earth, Wind, and Fire. They've done a lot of things. And some of their albums, literally, I bought just because of the covers. Um, they had uh, Egyptian temples there um, and their music and the energy and all of that. But I guess, you know, I think of Parliament Funkadelic. I believe George Clinton just um, made a statement just, re you know, recently something to the effect of, um, you know, we have returned to reclaim the pyramids. 
in, I guess, the George Clinton kind of way. Also, one of my favorites would be Michael Jackson's um, video music song, um, Remember the Time, where um, he had a number of other individuals there, um, Eddie Murphy, Amon, um, Mike, uh, um, Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson, yes. But, you know, to take a song and literally create a short film uh, was a phenomenal thing. And um, I, those are things that come to mind initially. Wow. There, there are others, because I remember seeing a photograph of Louis Armstrong playing his, his horn to his wife at the foot of uh, the, the pyramids and, and the like. But when I think of the musicians or um, artists that actually created things that were shared pretty globally, those are the initial uh, folks. That's that amazing. Yeah, absolutely. People need to know about that. You know, what is Afrofuturism? What is this stuff that we use from the past to, to look at the present and project ourselves into the future? I believe, um, I believe that everything we do is literally based on that, though. It's based on what's been done in the past or before. And we're right. building on, on it and pushing to the future. I think some people may focus more toward that, combining those two and deliberately pushing it into the future. But virtually everybody follows that pattern, whether they're aware of it or not. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and finally, you know, um, uh, the both of you uh, can be considered like Afrofuturists as you are using subject matter from the continent in your work whether it be literary or visual. Can you tell me about some of your future endeavors and how you want those projects to impact people and communities? Vanessa, let's start with you. Sure. Um, so graphic novels. Um, I, I talked earlier with you about how my work on ancient material tends to involve the interplay of text and art, so, th so the large scale images that are on temple walls and the hieroglyphic texts that go along with it. And um, graphic novels use that same interplay. And it, it's, I've been a fan of comic strips my whole life and I sort of never put two and two together until just recently that graphic novels are, are communicating in a way that is very similar to what's going on on the walls of Egyptian tombs and temples. Um, and, I, and it's so powerful to be able to communicate in both word and image because the words might explain what you're seeing or they might tell a completely different story that complements what you're seeing in the image or they may contradict each other for certain reasons that are important to the narrative. So there's so much you can do in that format and I see how people respond to that format today. It's a, it's a very powerful voice right now in the US. Um, so what I am, am looking at doing is taking the research that I'm doing on, on the early history of Egyptology in the US, the early 20th century history, and I'm looking to, to see how I can put that into a, the format of a graphic novel because I want this work that I'm doing to be accessible to a very large swath of people. And I, I feel that graphic novel format could be the way to do that. Absolutely, they say that, you know, comic books and graphic novels are modern mythology. Oh. So like, you know, like you see like what Marvel's done and right. some of the things with DC and Wonder Woman, it's just phenomenal stuff. Um, and, yeah, and, um, Mike, what about yourself? Mike, what about yourself? You know, some of your endeavors that you're doing. Well, I, I'm an artist, needless to say. I've always been, been that. Um, but I think for me, um, images are obviously very important, whether we acknowledge them or not. Um, we have found through study and science that um, the brain is a fascinating thing in its ability to restore, or not to restore, but to record and account everything it sees. So even though it may just be a glimpse, um, your brain records it. And I can base that on uh, the experiments with subliminal subduction, um, where they took uh, a movie, 16 frames in a, in a movie, and took one of those frames and put uh, buttery 
popcorn. So it goes past faster than your brain can co cognitively recognize it, but it impacts. And they found that when they did that in movie theaters, and I believe that was in the 50s, that people would get up in droves and go buy popcorn. And then they would follow that up with a uh, nice sparkly soda. In that one frame, you still watch the movie, you never realize it goes by. So for me, playing with images and putting, say, inf information, things that can give people strength and encouragement and hope and pride in images, whether they actually cognitively recognize it or not, I know that it registers. And they get to look at this a lot longer than that one frame one sixteenth of a second. So what I'm doing is what I've been doing. I'll continue to do artwork, um, creating beautiful images, um, structurally sound based on my understandings of history and science and um, imagery. So aesthetically, it'll meet all of those surface layers, but in terms of that other information and the light, that's there too. So it's planting seeds, whether people know it or not. And this occurs all the time anyway, but this is my effort doing deliberately. So this is my form of expression, is the visual arts. And that's sculpture, painting, printmaking, all of the above. It's amazing. That's amazing. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Guys, it is like absolutely a pleasure to have this conversation with you all. I knew that when, um, you know, just meeting Vanessa, then talking to Michael, being introduced to Michael that, you know, um, you know, you all are very special and unique people, um, very different perspectives on things. Um, and, uh, you know, like Michael, you, you participated in archeological digs in Egypt, not too many people, not too many people of color have done that. You not too many people of any, Right. Any ethnic group have done that. That's like a small, small, small minority, but definitely, um, you know, for a person of color, that's that's great. And um, Vanessa, for you to have like you know your perspective on history and trying to do those things to, you know, um, make those connections um, on an interdisciplinary level is just it's wonderful. So um, I want to say thank you. Um, and, um, I, I appreciate you, you know, being a part of this and, you know, hopefully when people view this, um, during burn week, um, for the Burning Man virtual events, uh, festival, um, they'll be very enlightened about things. Um, and maybe you can come into like VR, you know, we have on your computer or we'll get you some Oculus goggles because we have like, um a couple platforms actually three platforms going to be on but two platforms where we're going to be streaming the events um one is called um the dusty multiverse and it's very photorealistic and the other one is a little bit more you know playful that's alt space vr so we're going to have the shrine in, in there we're going to have like music in there performances people will be able to see this panel in those spaces and then you know so it'll be really good so uh yeah so during the week, you know, we'll have the schedule. You'll be able to see yourselves. I, I want to thank you, not just for asking me to participate, which I'm pleased and enjoy doing, but I think that the work that you're doing, the future aspect that a lot of folks just do not understand that the past and the future simultaneously, they walk together. Um, we tend to think of now and the present, but all of these things coexist at the same time. With respect to building the solar shrine, um, the concept, the structure, the energy, and the things that you're pulling on and bringing together, I think are phenomenal. I think a lot of people miss simplicity. And um, as a person who works with forms, shapes, and various other things, that's the essence of the, the strongest structures that will ever be built. It's simplicity. It's just being solid with it. So I thank you. You've been solid with your work. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. And um, like I said, I'm honored and pleased to be a part of this. Well, there'll be more conversations. I totally agree. Anton, I want to thank you um, for inviting me. And thank you for introducing me to Michael. It's been so nice to meet him and to become just a little bit acquainted with his work. I love, Anton, your vision 
for the solar shrine. I love what it stands for. I think, I think you've got a fantastic project. Thank you. I appreciate the compliments, guys. At least probably reincarnate from back then, ancient Egypt somewhere. I don't know, man. A lot of people been through Egypt, man. There are people, that's why people are drawn to it. Special place. It is. Special place. That it is. That All is. right, guys. Um, so I appreciate everything you've been part of this. And uh, let's stay in touch and collaborate in the future. Sounds okay. great. Same here. All right. Thank take you, guys. Care. Thank right, you. Good luck to everybody. And I'm definitely, getting, I'm definitely getting your book. So we'll, we'll be in touch with that as That's well. <gasps> Thank you all.